Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Saturday evening for Cashless Consumer's Payment Deep Dives. Uh, at Cashless Consumer, we've been interested in studying data flows involved in digital payments. Compliance regulations like AML mandates, which are global in nature, make it mandatory for financial institutions to share payments data to enforcement agencies for purposes of preventing money laundering and combating financing of terror. Data sharing is just these pose a threat to privacy. How are fintechs handling this regulatory dichotomy? Today we have with us Panchal Kumar, co-founder and CEO of Remitter, a cross-border remittance fintech focused on B2B payments. To talk about KYC, anti-money laundering in remittances, data flows and privacy, with a global focus on uh, global best practices and compliances. Panchal will make a uh, First, make a presentation. If you have questions, please type them onto the Zoom Q&A or YouTube chat or comment section of the event page, uh, and we'll have them answered. Ram Sundaram, co-founder of Terapay, will be moderating the session and will be interacting with Kanchan after his presentation. Over to you, Kanchan, now. Thank you so much, Srikant. Uh, it's my pleasure being here. Um, Thank you, Ram. It's, it's my privilege to uh, have you on this to talk about. Um, the most weird part about this, me presenting and talking about KYC, AMS, CTF, privacy, all of that, is that it was just a few years back that I was a customer standing on the other side of the uh, table, and I had no clue what exactly these jargons meant. And then I decided to found this company and today I'm talking about this. But the fact remains that I'm not here as an expert. I'm here purely as someone who has learned this uh, from first principles and try to uh, implement um, doing things uh, ground up. So what we really talk about here, so before I uh, jump in, I'm going to give you a quick 30 second introduction uh, of uh, Remitter. Uh, Remitter is a B2B payments platform. We are an alternative to wire transfers, checks, bank visits. Um, we see ourselves as a catalyst uh, to global commerce. We are focused on small businesses um, because we believe that small businesses need a lot more support in digital payments and um, making money move fast enough. Um, we typically service customers in Canada and U.S. to send payments uh, anywhere in the world and to receive payments from customers in U.S., U.K. and uh, Europe. Um, we make it easy for them to send payment to an email, use API to send payment. Uh, along with that, for a B2B payment, what is most important for small businesses, automation of um, uh, payments along with AR, API, and bookkeeping. So we, we help merge the two uh, so that the payment information which flows uh, is rich payment information which goes and it helps customers reconcile automatically. Uh, we have built a proprietary payment network which covers 75 plus countries um, to collect and disburse funds using local rails. The part which is very important and which we want to talk about today is how we went about building uh, our KYC, AMS, CTF, fraud and currency control compliances practice and um, here we are. Uh, we'll keep the questions to the end, um, but we'll keep your questions coming in. So what really is compliance? Compliance in very simple words is first laying down and saying what would you do and how do you do it? That's the most important part because that drives into the kind of documentation that you prepare. So compliance does not start till the time you actually lay out the entire documentation. Then you've got to train your team to follow whatever is mentioned as policies and procedures because it's not about one person. It's about the entire process being sensitized to the concept of compliance and everyone taking compliance is just as seriously as your compliance department would take it which basically means it starts with every customer facing function, including the person who sells the service must understand uh, compliances. The third part comes in is doing what you said you would do, which basically means that if you said, this is how you do customer KYC, or this is how you follow the, uh, this is the process of customer onboarding or transaction monitoring. 
you are doing exactly what you wrote. Then keeping a record of whatever you did. This is one business which is regulated. Regulation, regulators do not come and see on a real time basis, most of the places on what you are doing, which basically means that they would come and see what you did when they do an audit. So pre, as a precursor to that, you must keep record of everything that you did. So for example, if a customer came in and you decided, um, and you had certain additional questions with the customer answered, you must have the entire conversation uh, with the customer being recorded as well, because that conversation was the reason possibly which answered a few questions and that you, you took the customer. Auditing, and the auditing is something which is extremely important in our business. Uh, you have to audit, uh, you have to get yourself audited by a reputed external auditor for your regulatory compliant uh, practices, which is not just when it is mandated by the regulator because it is an obligation to maintain um, or, or to comply to uh, the policies and procedures that we ourselves have laid out to. And then periodically review your policies, periodically review your uh, implementation, take the audit report seriously and go ahead and um, revise your policies and procedures. But the most important part, there are so many terminologies that we're going to talk about here today, and I'm sure many of you would already know about this. The KYC is the most important part of the entire piece. Better you know your customer, lower the anti-money laundering or countering terrorist financing risk uh, is there because you have possibly established the credentials of the customer so you can trust the customer a bit more. It's called risk-based approach, but that's what really uh, helps in keeping most of the companies being efficient about compliance. Otherwise, if you do not know your customer, then you, you have to look at every transaction with the same degree of uh, detail and um, you, you would ask for a lot more data, which is neither efficient for the customer nor for yourself as a business. So when we talked about, uh, you know, you have to say what you would do and how you would do it. What we really talk about is laying down the policies and the procedures in advance. Now the policies and procedures are typically three parts. First is a privacy policy. The other is your uh, KYC, AM, and CTF policy. The third is the risk policy. There are three key important policies which are extremely important for you to have uh, right up front before we even um, start and process first transaction. Now, privacy itself has got two components. In usual course, privacy is about personally identifiable data, PII. However, when you talk about a payments business privacy has another dimension, which is a financial data. We capture and keep the details of bank account, of the senders, the recipients, their financial transactions, sometimes their documents which they travel, which is possibly the underlying documents such as invoice or purchase order, uh, which has to be sometimes even agreements. Now these are data which is sensitive, so you cannot really um, have any way in which data, this data is made available to anyone other than, even within your organization, forget about outside, other than the person who needs to know this data for the purpose of taking a decision. So it's, so it's extremely important to lay down the policies around uh, privacy, which basically talks about full disclosure on what data you're gonna be capturing, how are you going to treat this data? Who would have access to this uh, data? And in what circumstances you could, you could ask us to forget yourself or the customer could come and say, forget me, like the GDPR says. And in what cases you can, um, and how you can go and um, reach out to the customers. The other aspect which is extremely important for privacy is data localization. Worldwide, um, the data localization movement is going on where every country wants to ensure that their data remains within their geographical boundaries or the boundary which they trust. So for example, a 
country in the EU would want the data to remain in the EU because they know that if they need something, they could actually, uh, their hands would reach to that data. But when you talk about data localization and marry it with cross-border payment, then you're dealing with the data localization requirements of two different countries. So how do you really deal with the conflict of your customer being in one country and you have one data localization to follow, but the recipient of the money is in another country and you also have data, data localization to follow for that country. So how do you deal with that? The rule of thumb is very simple. Wherever the data is stored for the customer has to be where, where the customer is. So if a, your customer is in Europe, customer's data must be stored in the Europe. But the transaction cannot flow without the data along with it because it's not a physical cash which is flowing. It's a digital transaction which flows, which must have the sender and the, and the recipient uh, details. So the transaction data has to flow always across the country and data localization does not apply to that. But what really that applies to is how that is stored. So when it reaches a particular country and you are regulated in that country, then that part of the data has to stay in that uh, country. You cannot take the data and say, data moved from let's say India to Europe and now I'm going to store that in US. That is not done because US did not come become part of that data localization. Um, there are a lot of nuances of data localization, which is difficult to cover here. And I'm not even a legal expert to talk about that. Um, but it's extremely important to know what you are doing and get a legal opinion on whether that is the right thing to do. So what we're talking about here is the rule of thumb. The other part of data local, uh, other part of privacy really is the right of the customer to be forgotten. Now imagine a customer comes to your platform, does a transaction, three months down the line, the customer comes back and says, hey, please forget me. I don't want to deal anything with you. On the other hand, your regulator says that all transaction data with complete details have to be stored for seven years or different countries have got different um, rules along with that. What are you going to do? Are you going to delete the customer data from the details on the transaction? No, you cannot because then you're not complying with your regulator. It's a, it's a uh, pretty straightforward uh, rule again here is that when a customer says you forget me, you, you remove all customer data, but the data which went with the transaction, you're not removing that data. The transaction data stays. What it basically does is that you cannot ever contact the customer again. You cannot look up the customer uh, again but when a regulator comes back and asks you for the detail of a transaction, you should be able to furnish all the details, who sent the money, to whom, at what point in time. The policies and procedures of KYC, AML, and CTF is, is something which is best kept as detailed as possible. And that is what should actually become the baseline for a system to be developed and not the other way around because you cannot really say that this is how I capture uh, customer KYC detail. It's not only just what you capture, but also how you capture because the procedures are important as much as policy is how you capture, but you actually capture, uh, capture it differently because then you're not following the policies that you or the procedures that you laid out yourself. So it's extremely important to be very, very careful with what is the policy and procedures that you write in. It's very common for early stage fintechs to really come and say, hey, I have a consultant who's going to write the policies and procedures for me. It's great. All of us don't know this, so we must get experts to help us draft this. But as someone who owns the entire the policy document, as well as the implementation of that in the system, we must know clearly every line which is written there and how does that really translate into our operations because you cannot have a deficiency because when the audit happens, when your regulator comes, the first thing they would start by reading your policies and procedures and say, okay, show me, this is how you did this. And if you did anything different, you are uh, non-compliant to your own policies and procedure. Risk assessment is extremely important here to talk about. Risk assessment really sets the framework for how are you going to 
risk rate your customers? How are you risk rating your own operations or a transaction? How you define a particular transaction is high risk or low risk? What industries would you deal with? How do you mitigate the risk which are associated with your employees, your uh, physical location, if you have physical locations? How do you uh, mitigate the risks which are around your um, you know, software providers? You're using certain data sources and um, how do you validate and ensure that those data sources are right? Just to give you an example, when you talk about AML, one of the, um, the things that you need to do is to do watch list checks. There are, there are watch list databases which are available. You must test against that. Now, you're using one particular provider which gives you a feed for the data and you, every person that you onboard or you send money to you run against that. And you're assuming that their data is complete and always updated, but what if it is not? Whose responsibility it is? It's not your data provider's responsibility, it's your responsibility, which means that you want to ensure that you test that as well periodically to ensure that the data that you get is actually correct data and it is complete data, it is updated uh, data. So all of this, uh, they are the nuances, but they are extremely important for anyone in FinTech to know and understand because this could really make or break what you do. It's not just a commercial success or people uh, using your service, but it is about how you're offering it and you being uh, extremely careful about everything which you promised your regulator. So now let's just talk about nuts and bolts. Um, very quickly, we're talking about business KYC here. Business KYC is very different from individual KYC. What you do in individual KYC is a subset of what you do in business KYC because in business KYC, because when you deal with businesses, you also deal with individuals who own or run those businesses. Many a times we, we confuse ID verification with KYC. ID verification is one small part of KYC. Even for an individual KYC, ID verification is a very small part of it. It's an important part, but it's not everything. So what all goes into an elements of KYC? Uh, it starts with uh, company constitution, whether it's a incorporated company, it's a partnership, uh, different, com different countries have got different kinds of um, constitutions. In US, you would have a C Corp and an S Corp. Some countries you would have an LLC, uh, one person company, you would have proprietary structure, uh, you would have uh, sole proprietors. Some countries have registered sole proprietors, some places sole proprietors need not be registered. So dealing with sole proprietors is another uh, challenge because you must understand and ensure that you, un that you understand and you have taken enough documentary proof to, to say that this person is dealing, is using your service to run to process the business payments and not as an individual payment, because if you're a business payment company and your policy says you will process payment only for businesses, then you cannot take individual uh, uh, transactions, right? Jurisdiction of, uh, of incorporation is extremely important to capture. Um, what you need to do is that you need to uh, ID the authorized person who's going to be using the system, which may or may not be the director or the owner of the company you must get authorization from the director and the person who is giving that authorization, which is typically a director on the board, would need to be ID'd as well, at least one of them. And again, different jurisdictions have different regulations around it. And we'll talk about that a little later. What is the nature of business? Does that fit into your risk profile or not? What are the, what are the kind of transactions which they would use your system for? Again, while you would get to know later any which way, but you do need to ask that information so that you could risk rate the customer and set the expectation beforehand for your team or your system to know this is the kind of transaction which will be processed so that later on if the transaction volume is not the same, then you can go back and take a relook at it. Now, one of the most critical part and a difficult aspect in this is really the ultimate uh, beneficial owner uh, determination. Who is a UBO? As per all regulations everywhere in the world, it's not the person or it's not just a list of shareholders. It is the individuals ultimately who own this company. So let's take three different scenarios. I have a company which is owned by one particular um, individual. Then you have another uh, company which is um, owning one part of this business. 
and that company is owned by a third company, they could be complete layers. What is the responsibility that we have as an individual um, or uh, as, 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 a, as a business which is onboarding this customer is to understand and know which individual ultimately owns this uh, and what is the voting control which they have, which basically means it gets even more complicated than understanding what percentage of shareholding, but what percentage of voting shares that you need. Now, what is the complexity? The complexity that this data is not readily available. Now imagine if there's one company which owns uh, your customer partly is an, another jurisdiction altogether and that, that jurisdiction, the company registrar does not provide you uh, the details of ownership. For example, if you were a Delaware company, Delaware registrar will not provide you who owns the company, the company ownership structure they don't provide you. Which basically means that you have to use, start with a declaration and then go digging to figure out and satisfy yourself that you have ultimately found who all own this company and who, who all control this company. Um, one of the relatively uh, newer phenomenon, but which is extremely important is politically exposed persons. Politically exposed persons are people who are either politicians or people associated with them who might influence a particular transaction. Once you've collected all of this data, the onus is on us as a regulated entity to verify this data. So verification happens in multiple ways. One, of course, ID documents, you could use technology to verify that they are right and the person says, person is what he or she says uh, they are. The, uh, which you could use video or various AI technologies are available to do that verification. The document you can verify, but company registry data in countries and states and provinces within countries, some places this data is available electronically. So you have to have a way in which you can go and fetch this uh, data to verify. If not, you must have third party data sources which are reputed to be able to provide you that uh, detail about the company which they have uh, collected, which is to satisfy that the company exists and they whatever data they provided is actually right. But the most important part in this is really establishing the bona fides of the company. Company said, I am a toy store. Are they really a toy store? How do you figure that out? Thankfully, in a digital world, a deep web search could get you a lot of information about companies. You would have collected the address information. You could actually um, you use uh, you know, the web searches to go and take a look at what is happening there. You could even Google out. to figure it out that oh, this place does not seem like a warehouse at all, right? So it possibly is uh, not correct. And you would have people who will come and give you that information, um, sometimes intentional, sometimes only to create a bigger image of, bigger image of uh, you know, bigger image than what they actually are. Um, Anti-money laundering uh, is again, like I said earlier, if you have done a detailed customer KYC and you have established uh, sufficient um, data points and proof to yourself this customer is the right customer and they could be trusted, then uh, you could actually start with AML where you start with a baseline by saying, I know the customer, I know what kind of payments they would make or receive, what would the purpose typically be because they're a legitimate customer. And then you ensure that you are doing uh, watch list checks for the sender, watch list check for the beneficiaries. Um, you don't only do that, but you also check because many a time the watch list checks are actually gibberish data. There's hardly any uh, detailed actionable information in that. But what really comes out much more than that is web searches and adverse media reports. So you must subscribe to adverse media reports databases, which basically captures data about financial crime reported anywhere in the world. And you have to build your own algorithms to figure it out. How do you really get that? Because one of the biggest challenges AML is false positive. Believe me, if you were to search for Kanchan Kumar in the adverse media report, you would find some bootlegger somewhere in the world 
whose name is Kanchan Kumar, who was arrested, or some guy who cheated uh, someone um, or floated a company whose name was Kanchan Kumar. How do you know it's not the same Kanchan Kumar? Right? You cannot go with an assumption, no, they are not the same, which basically means you have to build a profile of your customer and then go out and match and see whether this person is similar to that person or not. Do I even have a reason to suspect? So not doing, uh, not working on false positive right from beginning could actually create a lot of compliance, increase a lot of compliance costs and create a delay in the entire process of uh, settlement. Um, again, when we talk about customer versus uh, beneficiary AML, customer AML is pretty straightforward in that sense because you know a lot about customer when a transaction being initiated to a company in another part of the world. It's a different ball game altogether because all you know about that company is the name of the company, possibly their uh, email ID, phone number, and bank account detail. You don't know anything else. But that does not mean that you cannot really, uh, that you don't have an obligation to prove that they are genuine um, customer. So again, it comes back to knowing your customer because if you knew your customer very well, that your customer is a pizza chain and the, uh, the beneficiary happens to be a steel manufacturer or uh, then you must know what is happening and why are um, you, you sending payment to a steel manufacturer in, in some other part of the world. It's a, it's a true story uh, because once you dig into that, it gets into what is called EDD, enhanced due diligence for the transaction. So you get into EDD and you ask the customer, why do you have to send payment to a steel company? And then you realize that, okay, they were getting the, the kitchen equipments uh, importing from there. And you say, okay, this is fine. You, you, you could uh, go ahead with that. Um, continuing with nuts and bolts, the most important part, like I talked about, was transaction monitoring. Transaction monitoring comes out in multiple different ways. You have to understand what is the value and purpose, why the, the same payment is being sent. Um, the biggest challenge in AML really is placement and layering. I'm not getting the details of that but just sufficient to know that placement is a way for ill-gotten money to be placed into an account which, which seems like legit. And layering is to hide, so that's where the AML really starts, that you have a drug money, you, you, you somehow get into an account of an individual uh, which looks like a legit. But then, to avoid being directly correlated with where the money comes from, you have to layer that transaction, route it through multiple accounts before the transaction initiates at your place. So you would think the money is coming from the sender A, but possibly that was that actually the trace of that money, trail of that money started much earlier. That's the biggest challenge, which is in uh, AML. I don't think there's a uh, straightforward answer to that, except that know your customer extremely very well uh, and their business. You know them, what is their volume of transactions, what is their revenue typically like, what kind of payments they, re, uh, they receive and make, and hence that will let your system decide whether this looks like a legit or does not look like a legit. Um, again, enhanced due diligence comes into that. You already know about you know, IP and geolocation tracking to be able to see there could be a suspected transaction or not. Um, reporting your transaction is something which is, um, is extremely critical because it's not only your responsibility to do what you did, but if you ever had a cause of suspicion, you must note what is a cause of suspicion and then report it to your regulator. Reporting to regulator basically means what was the cause of suspicion, when did that happen, how did you detect it? And then the transaction detail. Each regulator would have a different way to get the transaction, but the broad remains there are two kinds of reporting, accounts-based suspicion and transaction-based suspicion, which means when you're trying to open an account or someone trying to open an account, you're suspicious of that account itself or the account itself has started behaving suspiciously. Or when the account was open, that was, everything was fine, but a particular transaction looks suspicious. You must report that. Typically, that reporting means um, you know, providing the details of who the sender is, what was our declared purpose, what was the amount, what was the method of payment, and when, uh, where, did the, uh, where was the money headed to. Um, global nuances for this um, 
is really fascinating because while every country, every regulator has the same goal of stopping or preventing money laundering and preventing financing of terror, but the way they go about it is extremely different. Um, that starts with a licensing mechanism. So licensing, for example, in state in US is every state you have to be licensed if you are going to take customer from that state. Um, Canada, there's a federal license and there's a Quebec province which requires you to be licensed separately. UK, you could get FCA license, very progressive regulator, and till Brexit happened, you could just use that license across the, uh, Europe. Europe, get a one license, works across entire uh, Europe. UAE, you have a central bank which gives you license, but you also have three other free zone regulators which give, give you license, but then there are nuances of what you can do and what you cannot do uh, within that. Um, Singapore over a period of time has become very progressive with their license, particularly when it comes to uh, being fintech uh, friendly, the concept of sandboxes have come in. But what is most important to really note is that each one of them have, it's not that you're licensed in one geography, which means you know everything about regulations, no you still don't know a lot about that particular country because the nuances of that country, the business environment is very different. And the regulators have kind of tweaked the global standards to suit their environment and their risk uh, appetite. So basically when you're talking about a particular, uh, let's say whether there's a cop, and that applies to not just to business payment, but also to individual remittances. I'm, I'm sure Ram would tell you a lot more about it. Um, when you when you talk about any cross border payments, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you're dealing with a multi pronged beast. You're dealing with a hydra, and each each one wants to behave uh, differently. However, the common goal is that you must help prevent money laundering. You must help uh, prevent uh, the terror financing. Um, I have listed down a few tools and platforms. Uh, I'm not going to get the details of that. What we will really talk about here is how do you go about picking what tools to use? Believe me, if you do one Google search on KYC AML, you'll have at least six pages of response uh, of different companies which will show up on uh, Google search. It's not the same product you cannot blindly go and pick the most popular product. You have to figure out what exactly do you need? What are your key challenges of your business and pick products accordingly? If you're a large corporate, you could go ahead and pick the most mature bloated product. The reason I'm saying bloated is not from a negative sense, but they have like everything in it because they give you uh, out of the box solution, including case management, workflow management, everything built into it. If you're a FinTech, bad idea. Pick what is the best that you, uh, that you can't solve yourself or what you think is not core to you and go and find which particular provider gives you that particular functionality and integrate with that. Uh, for example, if you look at it, um, we ourselves have built a very strong, because again, when we talk about this payments, there are a lot of nuances we talked about. Um, when you actually uh, do AML, we picked up all the data sources, but we never let any of those providers tell us as to what is the score. We, did, we do our own scoring depending upon the rules and criteria that we can define and we can tweak over a period of uh, time. So it is extremely important to pick the uh, tools and the, the, the products that will fit into your platform. Ultimately, because remember, it's you who is responsible regulator, not um, the tools. Um, I have a small uh, slide deck, which I can always, because I'm run out of my time, uh, talk about as to how did we go about uh, building this. But any questions over to you, Ram? Thanks, Kanchan. That was quite informative. I would have happily let you talk a little longer about your tech stack and all the other stuff that we have. In fact, I think we may still have some time, so maybe we can expand on that uh, on the questions. I uh, we have a few questions that have come in from YouTube uh, and as well as on the um, on the Zoom chat itself. 
So I'm going uh, chronologically. So Karthik wants to know what are some metrics approaches used for tracking conduit accounts and conduit remittances. So I'm assuming this is a smurfing account detection question. Continue. That's right. Um, uh, sorry, it sounds like you know I keep going back to the same thing about KYC. But when you when you really establish uh, the bona fides of the company and you get to the ultimate beneficial owner you would be able to detect um, what is the relationship between more than one customer that you are onboarding. Um, it, there is no straightforward answer to that. It's like, uh, you know, a typical uh, game of policing where the criminal is always one step ahead of what the police is, which is why police runs after the criminal. Um, so strategies for that, um, vary over a period of time and we have seen how newer kind of scenarios uh, keep propping up. I'm not at liberty to talk about that uh, here because that's not going to be a proper thing to do about how people really do it. But uh, the most important part really is understanding um, each beneficial owner, understanding the relationships uh, between those beneficial owners is extremely important. Another thing that we, uh, we I did not touch about um, in this part of the world, what we really do when you get a customer, you you get them to give you a pre-authorized debit agreement. Now, that pre-authorized debit agreement basically means that you have the, uh, like in India, we got ECS, which gives you a mandate to go and debit their bank account as and when the customer uh, initiates a transaction on your, on your platform. Now, that requires that you must also go and validate the customer's bank account that they actually belong to that particular company, which it is supposed to be. Now that's a very, very important tool uh, to use when we, we try and detect uh, this as well. Does, um, does open banking really help in this? Because now you have account information service provider capabilities in PSD2 and in the UK. Do you have anything similar in North America that you can use? Um, to account related information. Yeah, so uh, there, unfortunately, there's no open banking here yet. But what is really critical to do in this case is the credit file check. So what one of the one of the strategies really is to do a soft check on the credit file, which basically means it does not show up as a hit. But you can use that as an identity verification tool. When you use that identity ver verification tool, you get uh, all the financial line items there as well. So we are not really concerned about the credit worthiness of the customer here, but what you want to verify is the identity of the customer. There you get the bank account details, which is not even disclosed to you. So it is possible uh, to do that. It would be the most efficient really is PSP2. Uh, unfortunately, Europe is far ahead of the rest of the world at this. And, and we, we don't want to be in at least North America for that. We are gunning for it. Let's see what happens. We have something like that being built in India right now. We'll talk about that later. It's not part of this <laughs> discussion. But to carry on from Kartik's question, um, you mentioned, you touched on it lightly. I wanted to actually dig into that a little bit. How much diligence do you apply, uh, apply to onboarding a beneficiary? Or is that only enhanced due diligence? No, we do. Uh, so for example, one of the common things which we do is again going back to the web searches. Now in today's day and age, we can talk about global commerce. Um, the benefit and it, it really helps that we are in a B2B space, which means the beneficiary is most likely a business. Um, or if they're an individual, they're an individual which is working as a contractor uh, to a company. So if they're working as a contractor to the company, there would be some underlying contract which would be there. They might have a LinkedIn account, uh, some data where if they're a freelancer, there would be some visibility they would have. Similarly, if you're a business which is selling, let's say a business in Vietnam is selling to someone in US, there must be some web uh, history for that. If there's no web history for that, it's likely a red flag in the first place. Um, if there's a web history, uh, digital footprint, wherever um, you could get an idea of what this, what are they about. And then you can look that up in the adverse media reports database to see if there's anything else which, is, which relates to 
their company or people who are associated with that company. Because typically you could actually look at a digital footprint. They can, you can find out who are the people behind that or associated with that uh, and look them up in the adverse media report. So there is a, a whole lot of things which is actually done uh, in this case. And last question on that same thread. Um, you mentioned integration with your customer systems, right? Uh, API kind of integration yeah. with your customer yeah. systems. Now, typically, every corporate has in place a vendor onboarding process where you collect vendor due diligence information, account information, maybe bank statement. So yeah. Is that kind of information shared with you so that it helps you validate the beneficiary? Or do you go in yes, blind? Yes, it does. So what we, yeah, so what we really do here is um, we many a times we collect because our customers are small businesses, so they may or may not really have that kind of a system in place. So we provide them a system like that so that we could collect information on their behalf. Also, it helps ensure that they are not liable uh, for the financial data which they are collecting for their vendors because ultimately if they collect and store it, they are liable for that data as well from the in privacy uh, law here. Uh, so we help you know, protect their privacy by doing that. And that helps us know the uh, beneficiary a bit more. Also, what happens is that uh, we integrate with uh, accounting software so that we can automate the entire process of payables or bookkeeping. Uh, that helps us know a bit more about the transaction history even before the customer really came into our uh, platform. Uh, I have a couple of questions from Pingali. Uh, the first one is that, is there a checklist of sorts? And I'm assuming that this was related to the due diligence information that is collected. And uh, my quick answer to that is that a, a compliance is full of checklists. There's nothing but checklists. But yeah. I'll add the second question as well together and maybe you can answer that. Uh, that is, what about the application interaction information during the transaction? Does forget me apply there? Yes. Um... Checklist, there are a whole lot of checklists at every point in, um, actually, if you look at not just compliance, even if you look at operations, it is just full of checklists at every stage. Because again, like I said earlier, compliance is not the responsibility of the compliance department alone. Compliance is the responsibility of everyone in the chain, right from the person who first spoke to the customer or your customer support person who is answering the chat reports or phone requests of the customer. Everything follows a uh, checklist. It is not, and that checklist keeps getting revised based on uh, the data and the interactions which uh, happen over a period of time. In fact, there's a checklist to also flag off transactions or suspicious activity of customers when they come on a chat or a, a phone call. They usually don't come on a phone call. A uh, customer would come on a chat to talk about that. Uh, so there's a checklist for that as well. There are a whole lot of checklists. Uh, now coming to the, uh, sorry, what was the second question? Yeah, it was, what about the application interaction information yeah. during the transaction? Does forget me apply there? Um, if there was nothing suspicious to report, uh, forget me applies there. We don't we don't store any data for the application interaction. However, except for the fact that we would still store wherever possible the IP address geolocation because that is that is taken as a transaction data. But if the customer came on a chat and discussed something and there was nothing suspicious about that data, and if the customer comes back and says, "Forget me," that data is erased. I would uh, like to add there that GDPR or privacy regulation typically applies to personally identifiable information and application interaction may not necessarily be personally identifiable, but it is transaction information. So it might need to store it for the statutory transaction uh, hold data hold periods that are mandatory in those countries. Um, yeah. So, so like, yeah. So, like I said, you know, if if the data is related to transaction, it will be stored. For example, an IP address or any question yeah. which come around transaction that will be stored. But if a customer uh, had an account and they came on a chat and interacted or um, you know asked certain questions, that is not going to be stored because that's not part of the transaction. Uh, Nishant Kumar has a question. Since uh, as part of account number and name verification, can we share beneficiary name to the sending entity, MTO or bank or to the sender itself? 
If yes, then does it violate data localization policy? That's quite a loaded question. Several jurisdictions, <laughs> different regulations. Kachin. Um, but, uh, yeah, two parts to the question here. Uh, first one, what data is required for the purpose of completing a transaction is not in our control as the processor, as a platform. That is defined by the um, recipient payment institution and recipient bank that this is the minimum data that I require to be able to process this transaction. For example, if you send a data to a particular country, let's say US, and you say, I need to credit uh, this via ACH, you don't need to provide the name of the recipient the routing number account number is enough to do that right now if you send that it's a discretion that you have it or your recipient because they want to do they, their compliance requires that they would want to receive this data do compliance check before they process the payment right if you're sending it via wire right wire transfers require that you provide full detail of the uh, recipient. You don't even have a choice there. Not even the receiving uh, bank has a choice there. You have to be uh, provided uh, that information with. Now, if it is a transaction information, like I said earlier, you comply to both uh, countries' regulations. But the transaction information, whatever data has to go, has to go. That would override the privacy uh, regulation. What it does not do, override, is that you cannot really share this information with anyone who does not need that information to process the transaction. You yeah, might want to uh, add to this round. Yeah, I, I think so. I think Nishant's coming at this from a slightly different place. And uh, I think the difference in our uh, seeing the question is you do B2B and I do uh, both. So that's where I'm seeing this. I think the if I read it correctly, I think what Nishant is asking for is that if the sender, and this is an app-based scenario, if the sender sends only the account number or a wallet identifier as part as a beneficiary um, account identifier, yeah. Are we allowed to share the beneficiary name with the sending institution or the sender in the course of the transaction, or does that violate customer privacy? And uh, we come across this in our situation uh, and it, uh, on a daily basis. And there are there are concerns that need to be addressed from a process issue. Uh, the primary concern always is that you then expose your platform to. Uh, enumeration attack where people are able to uh, send a list of accounts one by one and, and get the names associated with that. And depending on the jurisdiction in which you're identifying the accounts, this can be dangerous because certain jurisdictions allow debit requests to go through without uh, customer validation, without account owner validation and so on. So um, it is a, it's a loaded question. It is in some jurisdictions is possible, but you will have to put in place several process and technical fixes that to ensure that it doesn't get abused. Maybe even mask part of the name so that it's, there is enough data for the sender to verify that the account belongs to the intended beneficiary, but not actually um, use that for listing uh, enumeration purposes. Um, I think uh, Nishant, if you have a further question, um, Moderators, you can allow Nishant to ask that directly. Nishant, you're on mute. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, see, uh, as part of the UPI, like in India for the domestic transfer, uh, we are having like the moment we uh, miss uh, sender into the beneficiary uh, wallet ID uh, or UPI ID, uh, we publish the beneficiary name uh, in case of the domestic transfer. In the similar fashion, wherever we are looking forward to uh, internationalize UPI or we are looking forward to expose the beneficiary validation to the uh, sender, 
uh, that is uh, prior to the uh, transaction is execution so in that scenario whether it is you know uh, liable to do that uh, to the sender so that uh, prior to execution of the actual transaction we can ensure like money is going to the right beneficiary not to the some some company or, or to the some trust yes that's what i addressed in my answer which is that there is no blanket answer actually in compliance you will find this coming across quite often there is no blanket answer to any question the answer is always that it depends and it depends on the jurisdiction on the instruments that you use the interface that you use and so on the uh, the general answer is that it it is okay to do that so long as you ensure that um, that does not expose uh, the capability for somebody to keep sending you a list of numbers and collecting information uh, about the senders names on that behalf yeah and also and also it makes sense to like ram mentioned earlier uh, to sufficiently mask the information provided which uh, which gives the confidence to the sender that it's going to the right account but it does not give the complete information which could be used uh, for anything else okay so I'm... is that can, okay so is that can be handled with the agreement of the sending entity that is ali want to say no not the sending entity this is entirely uh, you cannot offset your legal responsibilities to any other entity in any situation it is you who have to take that decision uh as to whether it is legally permissible for you to share that information and what are the consequences of sharing that information okay uh, just to add little bit on this uh, see as per the today's cross border remittances uh, the sender as well as the recipient data are verified for the compliance purpose from both of the entity one is like sending entity and second one is the uh, receiving entity at that to with the ad ad1 category bank okay so in that scenario basically sending entity ensures the compliance of the both sender and recipient and ad1 category bank whoever is the first receiver of the information also ensures the uh, sender and receiver compliance now since the Uh, sen uh, since the sending entity is not having that much exposition of the beneficiary he has to rely on the uh, information what the beneficiary enters uh, at the sending platform so to avoid that one or uh, that you know uh, uh, that uh, can we share basically the beneficiary details to the him so that he can do the compliance check with the actual beneficiary name prior to handing over in transaction information to our system anjan uh yeah uh three things here number one like ram said when as a sending institution we collect data uh it is our responsibility first and foremost to verify that we know that this is a genuine transaction and we have done our checks on the beneficiary as well which is why i mentioned earlier that it is possible uh, for us to, with the limited information that we get about beneficiary to do the check second whether you send the beneficiary data to the recipient or not depends on two factors whether the payment instrument itself requires you to send the beneficiary information without which the payment will not be successful if that is not the case then the payment the receiving institution requires you to do this due diligence and that is something which you agree upon beforehand when you sign the uh, the uh, agreement with the institution as to what is the data which will be sent with every transaction to give an example uh, we process lot of payments which come inbound into canada um to credit the accounts within uh any canadian bank account we do not need the beneficiary's name we could credit it just with the um, transit number institution number and account number however our compliance policy says that we would do complete check even on the beneficiary information because sitting in canada i would i am in a better position to do that check than the sending institution so we whenever we sign correspondent bank agreement with any of the partners who are going to be sending payments to us in canada 
we make it mandatory to receive that. Now, because that is a transactional information and it is fine from a, uh, com uh, the um, privacy perspective because I am not going to be contacting, I'm not going to be storing that data of that individual aside from the transaction. However, it's my liability and obligation to my regulator to be able to report a transaction if the, uh, if the transaction was, sus was suspicious because the beneficiary uh, had some issues. Okay, got it, thank you. Nishant. So um, uh, Nishant had one more question, uh, which I'll finish before going on to the others. There are four, four other questions now. Uh, his other question was, uh, I don't know if you are uh, positioned to answer this question, but this is about the Indian uh, uh, liberalized remittance scheme uh, limits. So since LRS limit check in India is not being automated, so would you please suggest the ways to make outward remittances instant with such limitations? <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not an expert on that, just that I lived and worked in India for some time, but when I worked in India, I was not doing this. But uh, I've uh, worked with enough professionals, we have team which sits in India and they all come from banking, so I've learned small little bits about it. First and foremost, there is no system which uh, really checks uh, that detail, but at the same point in time comes back to the fact about uh, knowing your customer, knowing what other banking relationships um, which they have, and taking declarations. Um, you, there is no way that you can actually enforce this unless there is a system for data sharing which is created, which is not there right now. I don't even know whether that's um, in the works, but it can only be done at uh, the regulator level, not at the individual institution level or any kind of enforcement. Having said that, as a uh, institution, it is your responsibility to ask the customer, and which is where the declaration comes in handy, that you have asked the customer, but also match that with the customer profile to see whether that is, uh, which, whether this looks likely or not. Uh, Ram, you might be able to answer this better. Uh, we, don't, we don't do outbound from India, so I'm not specifically um, uh, the thing. But as far as uh, two things here, one is LRS applies only to individuals and not businesses. So that's, uh, that's one issue. Secondly, as uh, Kanchan said, since there is no central database uh, or, a, or a central online database which you can query in real time, there it's, you have to rely on the declaration from the customer. And the customer could very well be doing the same thing with four or five different banks uh, and pushing out transactions which cross his limits. And there is no way that uh, one institution will have visibility into that. So you have to rely purely on the customer declaration. And from a regulatory perspective, that gives you sufficient cut because there is no other way of verifying this information. But it is, uh, it remains your liability always. It does, you can't pass that on. Yeah. I'll move on to a question from, uh, okay, this is interesting because uh, this is, I had asked you this earlier when we were chatting, uh, Kanchan, what's the yeah. cost of compliance? So an anonymous attendee asks, what should be the typical cost for AYC and uh, KYC and AML checks? In general, I want to broaden that to saying what percentage of your OPEX goes in, uh, or even CAPEX for the matter. If you're buying uh, Actimize, I would suspect that a lot of your fundraise would go in uh, <laughs> buying that platform. So what percentage goes in? Yeah, a very interesting question. I'm sure if you were to ask um, different professionals in this domain, they would come up with a wildly different uh, number. Um, so I would take it uh, slightly different. I, I certainly talk about um, how uh, we manage the cost of compliance. So there are three parts of the compliance cost. Uh, first part is the capex, like Ram mentioned. Um, you have to buy certain systems. You got to, uh, or you have to develop certain systems to manage compliance. And in payments business, compliance is the bedrock of everything. Uh, you cannot. Uh, you know, take a shortcut on that. You can take shortcut on anything and everything, but you cannot take shortcut on compliance. So that certainly takes a large spend, um, almost a year building our transaction processing system from ground up. Uh, we knew exactly what we wanted to build, um, and compliance was the most critical part of that. The fact is that you may lose more money on 
wrong process, payment processing if you're not built your operational system and transaction processing system in place, but that still takes a second priority than building compliances. Uh, so we spend a lot of money on building uh, uh, compliance systems. So one way, um, so the way we went about uh, building was identifying what controls that we wanted to keep the asset, which we wanted to build, which is where all the uh, algorithms, all the risk rating uh, uh, logic and formula and um, intelligence was built, which we could keep improving it over a period of time. And what basically meant that we could subscribe to data sources. Um, the second part of uh, expense really is uh, the actual transaction processing compliance, which is onboarding the customer, onboarding a customer for um, a business customer is a lot more costlier uh, than uh, in, an individual because uh, a business customer has a cost of at least two or three different individuals that you're going to be identifying plus the cost of identifying the business. Now, um, if you get in certain, de depending upon how you get the data, it could cost you anywhere between uh, $2 to $50 to identify a business in this part of the world, depending upon how, uh, how complex the structure really is, which state the, the the company is incorporated in because you want to get the data from the source, which we try and do that so that uh, there's a minimal risk. Uh, the cost varies because each state would have a different price for giving you the uh, data. Uh, for example, if you take Delaware, Delaware charge you $20 just to give data of a particular entity. Uh, so you have to decide how deep you want to go and your cost would vary on that. Now the third part, which is the most uh, which actually rakes up pretty high over a period of time is the transaction monitoring cost because transaction monitoring. So you have onboarded a customer once that is done, you would do a re KYC possibly depending upon the risk rating, you would do it either every year or every two years. Um, but the transaction monitoring cost is every time a customer does a transaction, you are doing some uh, monitoring on that. And that transaction monitoring cost involves three things. It involves, um, you know, doing a, because there's a possibly a new beneficiary has come. So you've got to do uh, checks on those uh, beneficiary. Then there's a cost involved in actually monitoring the transaction pattern, whether it fits into that pattern or not. And if it is flagged off, then the human element involved in the data, which is collected on enhanced due diligence to, um, to process that data. If you are a traditional, uh, business of moving money or if you're a bank your cost is typically very high i'm not in a position to say what the cost is but i know it's very high because they rely a lot on paper documentation or a human intervention to, to process that information um as a as a fintech uh, because you have an opportunity to build something from scratch so if you realize that you want to put that in the process right on day one you can actually cut down a lot of uh, cost of transaction, uh, you can actually bring it down to less than a dollar per transaction, all included um, for your uh, compliances, even for uh, business payments. Ram, you would have uh, more um, visibility and views on that. Thanks, Ranjan. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's interesting because uh, in your world of business payments, uh, a twenty dollar onboarding, a twenty dollar verification cost may not be significant because uh, the ticket sizes are high. In yeah. my world, where we largely do uh, P2P, uh, so individual remittances, and we serve essentially migrant workers who are at the essentially the bottom end of the, the financial pyramid. So, uh, I mean, just as a number, our average ticket size for a transaction globally, and we deliver to about 70 countries now, is uh, about $150, right? Yeah. And with a customer like that, uh, with a business customer, there is also um, traction that happens when your customer onboard you onboard a customer, because you expect that customer to give you repeat business. Yeah. Right. And typically, the it's so painful for a business to get onboarded onto a payments platform in the first place that they're not going to go away lightly from you. You're likely to get repeat business. Whereas yeah. a migrant worker is going to look at what gets him the best rate at that moment in time and make that decision accordingly. So you cannot assume that you can amortize the cost of onboarding a customer across multiple transactions. 
That said, now the challenges are, uh, by definition, a cross-border payment coming from a migrant worker is coming from a country in which he is, uh, and I'm saying he because largely he, he or she, they are a resident, but they are, they are not really part of, uh, they're not established in that country, as in they are transient workers who may be there for a very short period or slightly longer periods. And the amount of documentation they have varies from country to country. Uh, and especially in, in Africa, where we operate a lot, sometimes they don't have documentation as well. So the only document that you have to go on very often is a passport and the visa. And the problem with the passport is that there is no easy way to verify if a passport is genuine or not, right? It can, for all practical purposes, appear genuine and uh, it can be completely fake. Um, Kanchan can't talk too much about his uh, issues that he's faced because his clients are uh, probably easier to identify. Uh, but uh, I can talk about my clients. We had one customer submit three passports from three different countries in the span of about eight months. We identified him using our <laughs> backend. Uh, there is, again, there is some stuff that we don't want to go into detail on this, but we identified picked him up. But how many of those customers haven't we identified is the key issue, right? So cost of compliance on that, there are the best way to do this, or the, currently the best available way to do this is uh, there are specialist companies that essentially index images of passports from every country that they can get, and then do a visual match to see how much your scanned document matches that. It's not a guarantee There is they don't hold any liability for telling you that this passport appears genuine and um, you can't, it's your call to proceed on that behalf. And like Kanchan said, you try to use multiple data points to verify how genuine that customer is and so on. So uh, if you're verifying a passport, I can give you active numbers. It varies from about a dollar to about $3, depending on your service provider, to verify one passport image. And uh, if it is just purely a data query in some countries where people have address databases online, identity databases online, uh, the cost of onboarding a customer can be as low as about 80 cents. But that is the general ballpark for customer onboarding costs. Um, then we have a question, Kanchan, how do you think Google Pay and WhatsApp Pay are doing in AML KYC? On mute? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I wouldn't know that and I would not want to uh, guess how they're doing. Uh, and I would slightly put uh, that question in a different sense, uh, in the sense uh, now that you are going to have this more and more increased disintermediation where you're going to have uh, payment service providers in the strict class of entities in India, Google Pay and WhatsApp Pay are. And, and with open banking and so on, you're going to have further uh, more uh, diverse players coming in. But would it also be upon them to comply and how does, uh, or would it just be the banks where the source of funds are? Or would app providers have no uh, skin in the game in terms of compliance? I was, yeah, I was coming to that. Um, that the only possible, I mean, like, uh, as, like Kanchan, I can't tell you how they do KYC. Uh, AML is fairly straightforward. AML is based on patterns and rule sets, which uh, don't necessarily rely on being able to verify the identity of the individual. You can operate on, um, on the MSISDN or uh, something like that. But uh, very, at, at least as of now, WhatsApp and Google Pay are, in, in the Indian context at least, are domestic payments. So they rely on essentially moving money from one KYC account to another KYC account. And while that is possible in a domestic scenario because the, the originating inst account holding institution, the terminating account holding institution, and the payment service provider are all regulated by the same regulator and the same jurisdiction, when you do cross-border, this doesn't work. You need to have far more regulation, far more uh, visibility into the end customer. So, yeah, uh, very strictly speaking about cross-border remittances, if Google and uh, WhatsApp start doing that, they will have to function just like every other provider does and collect your verification uh, information and verify it. Now, 
you could argue that they know you better than they you know yourself, but that still doesn't hold good. You need paper to prove that. <laughs> and also, um, I think, uh, and also, if you look at that, uh, one of the key things here is while they may one entity of Google may know about it, are they permitted to share that data with this entity of Google, uh, or you know, one arm of Facebook knows about it, are they permitted to share data? Uh, that also is a um, area of debate. So it certainly uh, is, I, I would say it's complicated is how I would put it. Um, yeah. As soon as you go cross border, so remember we talked about the risk uh, assessment. So when you actually prepare risk assessment, you have to look at all the various payment methods and instruments in each of the countries. And you have to assess the risk whenever the payment is going to that particular country or risk is uh, to figure out how are you going to mitigate uh, the risk for that. And that's something which has to be a part of your uh, risk mitigation policy. Yeah, thanks. I was just reading the questions also in the meantime, preparing for the next one. Uh, Nadika has a question. I think we answered that, but maybe we can go into a little more detail on that. Uh, related to due diligence onboarding, how do you find a balance between the customer's right to be forgotten or their privacy and businesses needs to remember a customer for the longest time to prevent frauds, help with detecting frauds? Very interesting question. So uh, this is something which comes very often and we also debate it uh, and I think we have find a, found a right balance. So the, the privacy is about personally identifiable information. As soon as you strip the data that you hold of a personally identifiable information, you are taking care of the privacy part of it because now that data cannot be related back to that. However, the patterns don't go away you don't forget patterns, right? And fraud detection is not about knowing about the individual. It's actually about knowing the pattern. There's hardly any fraud fraudster who will come and use the name, same name twice, or in Ram's case, use the same passport twice, knowing fully whether that passport has already been busted once, right? So PII is not the most important tool for fraud prevention. It's the pattern, which is the most important tool. So you don't ever forget the pattern. That's the biggest asset that you create in your fraud prevention armor. Ram, you would have seen a lot more fraud, I guess, in the uh, individual transaction, consumer transactions, remittances domain that I possibly see it in the business domain. We do have, of course, a lot of attempted um, fraud. And mind you, the kind of fraud that is like a large... Uh, yeah, yeah, your, your risk is very, very high. Yeah, your risk is very high. Yeah, so which is where it's extremely important to understand uh, the the patterns. So Ram, your risk you... is very yeah, your risk is very high in one in that sense. My risk is very high in the uh, CFT CTF sense because uh, uh, the 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 institutions that investigate those crimes tend to be a little more robust in their investigatory techniques. So yeah. my AML officers are especially uh, vulnerable there. Um, yeah, so what we do is uh, we tokenize um, the identity of the sender and store that so that we can do pattern matching. We can keep that. We can, we can uh, use that for fraud and other analytics, but the PII remains separate. And uh, when we need to forget the PII, we can forget that, but the token still remains. So it's, uh, that, that's the way we handle it. It is, it's hard to, have a definitive answer to that because um, privacy and uh, say regulation like GDPR are fundamentally opposed to financial regulations everywhere. The way that regulations are structured everywhere, right? So it is. It's there is no easy answer. We it is on a case by case basis, and at the the worst case scenario would be if you have a conflict, you put everything on hold and ask a regulator what you can do on that particular case and pass it right back to them, to both your regulators, to the financial regulator and to the privacy regulator and tell them to sort it out between themselves really. So that is the, that's the, I think that's where we can ultimately. No, absolutely, very, very well said, Ram. Hmm. Right, thanks. So now uh, there are a couple of comments. Karthik said that UPI services beneficiary name with verifying DPA for beneficiary, although this is limited to India. That's true. There are, and in my experience, there are a very few banking network ACHs in over the world which return um, a ben beneficiary name, account holder name, when you are uh, validating a transaction. 
There are some that return it when you actually execute that payment instruction. Um, Nigeria is one, India is one, uh, the uh, IMPS, NEFT return the names. And uh, there are a few others uh, globally. But largely, banking networks are a few generations behind in terms of this capability. They do not even validate a name. So for example, today, you could send a transaction to my account number, but to a name with the beneficiary name as Kanchan Kumar, and it'll get delivered into my account in India. Nobody, the receiving institution doesn't check. Nobody, nobody checks it. And that actually places more of a risk on cross-border entities like Remeter and like Terrapay because we are obliged to ensure that we are delivering to the right account, but there is no technical way of getting that information back. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. And I had a so, so over, here, over here again, you know, um, the, so if, if there is a suspicion which is there that this may not be the right uh, beneficiary account, um, we, we have had occasions where we have actually requested uh, the sender because we cannot directly go and request a beneficiary unless they are being onboarded by us uh, for uh, void check, for transactions which are higher value transactions uh, or a higher risk transactions to ensure that the account actually belongs uh, to them. Um, some countries, you could use services which allow them to log in and fetch the information but that's also limited. It does not really work everywhere. So there are some ways in which you can do it, but there's no 100% way to do that in most jurisdictions. Yeah, and especially for low value transactions where the cost, the yeah. cost of doing that may not, uh, you know, Absolutely. justify. Uh, Shrikant, you were saying something? Yeah, I just have one question uh, on uh, the role of technology and how you see both the AML regulator, which is the FIUs across different countries adopting technology. And are there like uh, best practices in terms of uh, most effective and privacy friendly approaches? Uh, in India, we are actually seeing the upgrade of the FIU system being planned, which possibly foresees AI and ML uh, into it. I don't know if it's just marketing jargon or are, are they doing something about it? And of course, uh, then of course the other tech question or the joke is what's the role of blockchain in this and, and can it help better? Uh, so your thoughts on this and, and then probably we can do this. There are no other questions. Okay. Yeah, so um, two things here. One is that let's accept it. Uh, FIU is a black box which only FIU can tell you what's really happening inside. Um, our role is to provide data to FIU uh, as per the um, regulations which are there. If there is a suspicious transaction or suspicious account you report it, sometimes they would also ask you to provide beyond a particular threshold, there is a cash transaction or an electronic transaction, you uh, report that since we don't deal in cash transactions, at least we don't have to bother about that. Uh, I'm assuming uh, that would mean a lot more transactions for uh, remittance companies which deal in cash. Uh, but because we are a business payment and hence the transaction values tend to be higher. Um, uh, so for example, uh, one of our regulator requires that any transaction done $10,000 and above needs to be reported, which basically means that if there are a business which sends two transactions of $5,000 each, that still needs to be uh, reported. So that's one part of the reporting that we do. What really happens to once we report, we have no clue about it. The other part which happens is when they come to you and ask you for certain uh, information, uh, which possibly gives you an idea of what they might be working on, but you would never know, you could only guess, but you would never know what they were really working on, how they were working on. Um, so the third aspect of that really is when they publish annual reports. We have annual reports where you get some glimpse of what kind of data is processed, who do they deal with, who do they really supply the data to. Um, and maybe you'll read some media reports about some major ring being busted and you possibly go back and see, did the information that you provide have something to do with or not? But you can, again, that could only be your guess. You have no way to uh, know that. Um, the role of AI and ML very certainly 
uh, in AML is undoubtedly has to be there. Um, because the volume of transaction that we process is high. Now imagine the volume of data which they get, right? And AML, like Ram was saying earlier, it's all about pattern matching. And if you're doing pattern matching, human eye can only do so much. Different human being is going to look at only so much different ways, um, which is why uh, ML is extremely important piece in uh, AML, no doubt about it. Uh, blockchain, questionable. Blockchain would work. So my thumb rule is uh, how many parties are involved? Are they all equally participating in that? If you look at just as a distributed database, where each party controls their own access database, possibly yes. It is going to become a possibly a permission back blockchain. There are some uh, projects which have been tried, not very successful. Um, private entities have tried it, few regulators have tried it. Is it possible to do it over a blockchain? Possibly yes, in on a permission blockchain uh, with uh, tokenized information being shared. Yes, it is uh, possible to do this. How far this will be adopted? Because for a blockchain to be adopted, each uh, each party who which holds the KYC information has to be on the blockchain, um, and that can only be done when it is mandated by the regulator uh, to do that. That everyone has to run a node and has to submit information which they get. Um, it is very early days for blockchain. I would not dismiss it, but I don't see that becoming mainstream anytime soon. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, as far as uh, the AI and ML role goes, the, uh, that question, ML definitely, and as well, building on Kanjan's uh, response to that, uh, it's ML, uh, our AI, AML efforts are all about pattern recognition and pattern um, matching. And currently we are limited by, our, by the patterns that we define that get matched, right? If I think this, this is a pattern and I set my systems to look for that pattern, then I get that pattern. I can match that pattern and then my uh, reporting officers can look at it and, and determine if it is uh, actual uh, suspicious transaction or not. What I can't do today with traditional systems is to detect new patterns. Right. And if I have an ML system that is able to identify new patterns, present them to my uh, MLR rows to determine if that is a benign pattern or a pattern that we should monitor for suspicious transactions. I think that would be a huge improvement in our ability to, to fight financial crime. Uh, as far as AI goes, I really don't know what that is. I mean, we, we talk a lot about it, but I really have no uh, working definition for an AI at this point. So I'll, I'll, I don't have an answer for that. As far as blockchain goes, I really don't see what we can do with blockchain today. It's, um, it's that cannot, let me qualify that. I don't see what we can do with blockchain today that can't be done with our traditional databases. There is no additional value that I see and I'm not an expert, but I don't see this uh, today. And if you're talking about a cryptocurrency kind of thing riding on blockchain, I think the use cases are different. Those are for non-trusted networks. Uh, uh, what crypto is for essentially paying somebody that you don't trust, right? And that and you are you are building for that lack of trust by having other people sign that block, that tra that transaction in the block, and so on. Whereas Payments in the regulated financial industry is all about trusted relationships. There is no way that I'm going to pass a payment on to another payment financial institution without having a contract and enormous amounts of due diligence done, right? Which builds that trust. So these two things are two separate worlds altogether. Blockchain and crypto may have a role in payments in the future going ahead. Uh, they, uh, that is not necessarily something that fits into the, the world that we operate in, which is a world of trusted payments with know your customer as the key principle of that uh, basis. Um, Shrikant, I think there are no other questions. Uh, there is a comment from Tyrell saying that 
YouTube and Amazon protect money laundering. Twitch is really bad with it. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there are ways to launder money on pretty much every platform, including a lot of games and so on. And uh, not our world, at least. <laughs> so, yeah, at least not my world. I can't speak for you, Kanch. <laughs> not my world. Uh, so, no, pretty, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, actually, that that's it's a it's interesting because which is what really makes the payment business so fascinating that you you cannot simply take one payment business which services one segment of customer and say because now I service the segment of customer I can service everyone in the world it doesn't work so I'm sure uh, people who process payments on those platforms are someone are something they would know how to manage uh, their regulatory obligations. We don't know because we just know we specialize in our kind of customers and we know how to manage the risk for these customers uh, well. Yeah. Uh, Zainab has a question. Yeah. But when you do machine learning and AI, are there hazards of violating data localization rules and privacy rules? Sorry to be obtuse. obtuse. Maybe you already answered this, Ram Kanchan Shrikant. I did not. Uh, and I'd actually not thought about it at all. Uh, um, in one sense, uh, if I may, uh, we did talk about briefly about patterns and not PII. Kanchan mentioned in one sense yeah. that it's all yeah. about patterns. And if it's just about patterns, and, and there's probably no privacy harm, at least, but data localization and related to Kanchan. Yeah. yeah, and I yeah. guess so, that depends on. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Ram. Sorry. No, that depends on what. Your data model actually feeds into your AI and ML systems, right? So if you if you uh, re uh, ensure that the data that is fed in is only transaction information without PII, then then I guess it doesn't. Uh, Kanchan. Yeah, exactly. So the way I look at it, there are two different perspectives. FIU possibly has a very different perspective to it uh, than we have it, um, and I can't really talk on behalf of FIU. Uh, because FIU is possibly trying to gather data from multiple sources and PII is important to them for to be able to build uh, the profile of a person, how the person behaves across different uh, providers. I don't know of that and I can't speak on their behalf. But when we look at it from our, our perspective, um, it's not really um, common for us to really look at PII because it actually does not add any value um, in uh, any kind of pattern matching. What we adds value is what the customer does, where are they sending payments, what is the value of payment, what is the purpose of the payment, what is the frequency of payment, uh, what is the kind of business. Um, you know, it, I mean, those are kind of things which, uh, where does the payment really originate, what time of the pay payment originate, those are kind of things which really has a lot more value to us than who the person is. Yeah, and uh, to your, uh, you just mentioned what FIU sees. Uh, to an extent, at Therapy, we see that same thing because we have multiple financial institutions as sending partners and as receiving partners. And therefore, we see the same customers transacting across different partners. And uh, we can then see them in aggregate and rather, rather than just in uh, as a discrete uh, transaction. So there is value to be added from that. There are times when uh, our systems have blocked transactions because they have come from a similar customer, what we identify as the same customer, but across multiple providers at the same time uh, and close to the thresholds and so on. So, you know, the usual pattern filters. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there is, there is more value, there is value in having information from more than one uh, institution. And that's, I guess, where the, the FIUs can build on um, you, this intelligence. There is a interesting comment from Anupam. Uh, in ML, there is a field called differential privacy, adding noise to data before doing ML to get cal guarantee calculated privacy. So yes, there is there are ways to ensure that. Yes. Yeah. Shrikant? Yeah. Have we um, reached our limits? Time limits? Uh, I think we're just about ten minutes over the time. Yeah. I don't think we have any more questions, right? Uh, Nishant has a question just now okay. about account number, name check for beneficiary, although transaction get rejected if name and account of beneficiary does not match while processing to any FT or IMPS, but it never returned the beneficiary name to cross-border MTO or back. 
Um, Nishant, it, it, um, I think all I can say is that you need to speak to your bank with whom you have an RDA because uh, it is NEFT and IMPS definitely do return the account name, the, the account holder name, but after the transaction, not before. So you can't validate it, but they return it after. Yeah, so after the transaction, it does happen. Um, and uh, it is dependent upon who is your RDA uh, partner bank and what kind of integration they, uh, you have it with them, whether you actually get that feedback from them or not. So it's possible they have it, but you don't get that uh, data out because they certainly get that data uh, with them. And I think by default, they don't share that data unless you make a valid case for getting that data because uh, yeah. again, they're also concerned about um, sharing information. Yeah. So, you know, a very simple case, for example, we don't permit payments to charities in India for obvious uh, reasons. So it is important for us to validate that the, uh, you're not sending it to a temple trust, but putting someone else's name uh, for that. Sometimes that that comes in handy. Yeah. There are certain banks in India which uh, get around this by actually having word filters and uh, We've had situations where transactions to in individuals with the name of Midi or Pearl <laughs> failed because a word filter flagged that as a business rather than as an individual. Uh, so yeah, there so, are certain so, banks that do this. Yeah, so actually that, that's something that we build as a, uh, that we build as a tool ourselves and that's where again uh, that gets automatically built up is that if a transaction gets rejected, it goes in a word filter. So next time someone tries to add something which is not an individual, and it has got anything of that sort, it will get uh, flagged off right in the beginning. So again, it comes back to learning patterns and ensuring that you block it at source rather than waiting for the transaction completion. Yes, but again, it's it's actually, I think that's a failure of the, the design of the ACH in the first place because you should have flags on accounts which indicate if they're business accounts or personal accounts, which would make it easier to validate these transactions rather than rely on word filters, which can be extremely inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, basically what I experienced is like these uh, like bank, they say like account number and name is not matching, but uh, the over the integration, they did not say like this, uh, this account belongs to so and so name until unless we ask uh, offline through the email. So this is the point that basically I want uh, to be. Yeah, I would recommend that you speak to the bank's technology team. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure, sure. We'll take it up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah so, if there are any more questions, thank you, Kanchan, for the detailed talk. And uh, especially, I like the nuts and bolts of uh, KYC AML. I'm sure the audience will uh, learn I think a we lot need to do a great session, Srikant. Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions which I didn't get to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could do one more as well. Uh, in fact, I would probably uh, will pro probably keep a track on remittances and AML and try and see if we can get more granular topics uh, and we can get back together on the same uh, platform. Absolutely, Shrikant. The only, only change I would suggest is that next time Ram will present and I'll ask questions. Sure. <laughs> See, he got around my asking him the questions bit now. So, <laughs> just turn that around. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, thank, thanks Ram as well for joining in uh, moderating this. I mean, it, it actually helps for uh, someone to actually be in the know and ask the right questions and Thanks for uh, joining in and thanks everybody for joining in on a Saturday evening and uh, I would urge you to join our telegram group if you have not joined, it's t.me slash Catalyst Consumer uh, and tell us uh, what would you would like to hear in future events. Uh, we would probably have uh, one more event uh, coming up with Ram sometime soon on payment system design. And we're also planning to do a study circle on uh, the Bharat bill payment system, which is a hero payment system in India. And, and we'll uh, keep posting updates on our uh, channel and uh, do subscribe in future events as well. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Nice to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.